So my name is Patricia Kelly, and I am age 72. Very happy to have gotten this far. Today's date is May 16th, 2023. And here we are in Boston on a beautiful spring day. You're right. And my interview partner is Judy Stoyer, my longtime friend. And neighbor. And neighbor, yes. 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 And we were neighbors, still are, in Jamaica Plain, which is a really interesting, fun neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And we might not have met, Pat, even though we're neighbors, if you hadn't done something really peculiar one bold. day. <laughs> bold. I call it bold. <laughs> <laughs> so... I moved to Jamaica, uh, well, I moved to Jamaica Plain in 1976, but I moved to Borough Street, where you and I were neighbors, in 1977. And that was the year where a lot of people in Boston, mainly white people, were moving out because of busing. And I bought a really nice house on Borough Street that I loved. And, but there was a house around the corner from me that I really liked. It was your house. And um, my mother and I were walking by, and we talked about what a nice house it was. And we thought, oh, I wonder if she'll move out because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> black person moved in. Maybe she'll move out. <laughs> Maybe get lucky and get a racist right. here. Yeah. Right. So we knocked on the door because we really wanted to see the house. Uh, turns out that we picked the house of a raging liberal <laughs> who was happy that we had moved in and uh, showed us around, and we became friends. Yes. And we were fortunate that our kids were, your kids were above mine and below mine. That's so right. we had a great relationship uh, through many, many years, many, many That's schools, right. many, many jobs, uh, and lots of trials and tribulations. Well, one uh, place where we intersected, I mean, we were always very good friends. Because who wouldn't be starting off like that? Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> that was so Can charming. I buy your house? Can I come? <laughs> you come and look at my house? Okay. Um, was at the time, I was a reporter here in Boston, and you were a teacher, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yep. And we were both kind of starting out our careers. Uh -huh, yeah. You well, know? I started in 1974 which was the year that busing started yeah. in Boston. It didn't start, I started in Charlestown. I was a brand new teacher. I had just graduated from college. So I was very, very, very excited to be starting uh, in a public school system, Boston Public Schools. So um, I was assigned to Charlestown. However, Charlestown didn't bus that year. They held That's off, right, second uh, year. Right, 1974. So. They, what they did, though, was they sent five black teachers into Charlestown. They switched five black teachers out with five white teachers. I was brand new, so I didn't have to be switched from any place. I just got hired. So I worked at the Holden School. So Elementary school? Elementary, and it was only four teachers, uh, two kindergarten. I was the first grade, and there was a second grade teacher. And there was a very, very, very part-time uh, Title I teacher there. Um, and then the other... Uh, four teachers worked at uh, the Hold not uh, sorry at the Warren Prescott and the Harvard Kent. So um, basically, we would go in. I went in every day by train, and um, it was a very interesting but tough year. And I think I'm grateful that it was my first year because I think I was so excited about being there that a lot of the racist things that happened. I was able to like just move forward. I loved my class. I had all white kids. They were all from the projects. They were all poor, poor, poor. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved them to death. Um, basically, I, I went to a school where they were very angry about busing. I spent the entire year, not one of the teachers in the building speaking to me. Really? So every day going into work and nobody talks to oh, you. Oh, that's terrible. It, it was. It was horrible. Um, I mean, mainly it was my 20 whatever kids, number of kids who spoke to me every day. I felt like my vocabulary went down to <laughs> <laughs> three letter words that all rhymed. <laughs> um, but, uh, Wait, yeah. But let me ask you something, though, because do you think um, they. One of the problems, of one of the myriad of problems with school desegregation in Boston was people assumed intent when there wasn't any. Now, sometimes mm -hmm. there was, but by that I mean I was a reporter and I was assigned to South Boston mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. two years mm -hmm. where a lot of the protests, was kind of the heart, the, the centers of the protests were South Boston and Charlestown, mm -hmm. which we, between us, covered mm -hmm. those bases. Right, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. but people in... South Boston, some people would scream at these buses of black kids, six-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And you'd want to say to them, and I did sometimes, do you think they want to be here? 
Do you think their intention is to come in and... and you mean the kids, the, the six-year-olds, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And your mm -hmm. intention in... You were assigned to that school. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe you would have mm -hmm. volunteered. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, it's it just seems uh, inexplicable to me that other teachers wouldn't talk to you. Well, you know, the thing was, the that was the first year. So the first year... Um, I, I was really on my own, and, uh, and when I say I was on my own, I met the principal once, and if you put a gun to my head right now, I would not know his name. It's a small school. It was a small school. What happened was that he was in charge of all four of the elementary schools. Yeah. He came in one day, he introduced himself, he, uh, he said his name, I didn't even know that he was the principal, and um, that was it. So I never really had anybody come in to supervise me. Fortunately, my mother had been a is, was a teacher, yeah. and I had a really good, solid educational teaching career at Northeastern. Plus I had co-op from Northeastern, so yeah. I'd been in multiple school systems. And good thing because then I was able to do something for the kids that I had. Yeah. So, you know, those teachers not speaking to me, that the school not providing me with materials, who did it hurt? It didn't hurt me. You know, I went home every night and I copied materials. I got materials from friends, from my mother, um, and I brought them in every day. Um, but it was the kids who were going to be the losers if I didn't do that. Um, each day was a challenge getting to work because I took the T in. And at the time, it was the elevated uh, orange oh, line That's that right. stopped at Thompson Square, yeah. no longer. Yeah. And I'd have to walk up the hill past the Boys and Girls Club, which was always an event. Um, and one time I did get surrounded by a group of men who uh, were screaming at me and calling me nigger. Yeah. Um, and the police pulled up and actually took me away. And uh, after that, I would go to the police station in City Square, and they would drive me into work. So that happened for a few times. But, you know, again, with – so we did all of this work around um, busing and talking about – moving kids here and there to equalize the number of black kids and the wh white kids in the school. It was never, never any discussion about how you were going to support the teachers. Mm -hmm. um, teachers, we, the one concession was that before school started, we had two weeks to plan. And during that, and usually you have two days, during that two weeks, uh, we had workshops. But, you know, a, one workshop doesn't, doesn't get to your heart, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't get to people who have taught an all-white class all their life, and now they're having black kids coming in. Uh, it doesn't get to having um, a colleague who's black. Mm -hmm. So it was a real learning experience for everybody. Um, Were you afraid all the time? I, 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 that was the advantage of being young, <laughs> wanting this job, want, really wanting to teach. I just, I mean, if they'd put me in... Any place, I would have been excited about being there. And once I got into the classroom, I was fine. And, you know, it's funny that you asked me if I was afraid. I should have been afraid. Now, looking back, I mean, uh, I can't run that fast. <laughs> <laughs> and not through a crowd of grown men. You talked your uh, way out of it, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, well, except that um, what I said to them didn't lessen the, oh, their it, angst. Did, did, did you pour uh, gasoline on the fire? I sort of. Yeah, Because yeah, I was young. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and and uh, to the point where there would be teachers who would see me walking up the hill and they'd be driving up. And they'd see me with my bags because I always had a ton of bags with mm -hmm. all the stuff I was using to teach. And they'd honk the horn and wave to me oh. and never ask me if I wanted to ride. Now, you know, Charlestown is all hills. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one point, I, two teachers actually from the other school walked with me. And um, a kid walked past me and called me a nigger. And what did those two teachers do? They crossed the street and left me. No, they didn't. Oh, yeah. So, you know, nobody wanted to be involved. And part of it is that they did not know what could, they didn't know what they could do. They, you know, they're dealing with their own angst. Um, and they didn't have any, there was no training. There was no discussions. Nobody talked about what yeah, was going that's on. Right. And there was nothing at the beginning of the school year to say, okay, like we, we've, Boston has fought busing for 20 years. What do we do now? Yeah, we that's just right. throw everybody together and it's all going to work out. As far as, you know, you're saying about parents or people out there um, yelling at kids on buses, we used to, uh, 
in the second school I was at, which was the Bunker Hill School, we used to dismiss the buses before we dismissed the white kids so that the buses could get out of town before the white kids uh, were dismissed. Mm -hmm. Now, that was great for the kids, but remember, I had to be dismissed too. Oh, that's right. So I had to leave. And, you know, some of the stories, when I look back on them, I think, oh, that was sort of funny, though at the time it wasn't funny. So the first day that, um, the second year, so, so the first year I was at the Holden School, and it was a horrible year, but, you know, my kids and I loved each other. As a matter of fact, I called my mother and I said, I think I have geniuses. <laughs> She said to me, what do you know? This is your first <laughs> class. <laughs> so um, at the end of the year, the oh, I should go back. At the beginning of the year, I was assigned to the Title I class. Mm -hmm. So I decorated the room. I Wait, made explain, a, re tell people what that is. Oh, Title I was the reading program. Before you get there, sorry. Um, uh, the Stop banging. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, Title I is a reading program, and uh, what you do is you take small groups of kids. So I was assigned to that, so it didn't, meant I didn't have a classroom. Um, what the NAACP realized was that a lot of the Boston, the uh, black teachers who were hired were assigned to these itinerant positions, and they wanted them in the classroom. So unbeknownst to me, I had been switched to first grade, but the assistant principal who was in charge didn't tell me until the day before school started. The teacher that I was switching with knew, so she hadn't decorated the classroom. So I left a fully decorated room and went into an empty classroom the day before school started. So I got there early and put up as much as I could. Um, she was not happy and barely serviced my kids for the year. So she was another one. The only person who I spoke to mostly was the school nurse who came in on Wednesdays. So that was a day. The rest of the time I ate alone. Uh, there were no specialists. The music specialist came once that year. She was supposed to come once a month. She came in June and taught all nine songs for the year. So we were singing Jingle Bells in June. <laughs> Yeah. You, you and your geniuses. Yes, I mean my geniuses. <laughs> we were like, we don't care. <laughs> we learned all nine songs. We learned all nine songs in one day. See, I told you they were geniuses. Um, anyway, so at the end of the year, the assistant principal comes to me and he says, I have good news and bad news. He says to me, the good news is that you're rehired for next year. I'm like, oh, yay. He says, the bad news is that you have to change schools. I'm like, uh, that sounds like good news to me. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the bad news? So, yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> bye. <laughs> and I think I ran out immediately. So um, the second year when busing started, I was moved to the Bunker Hill School, which is at the end oh, of yeah. Charlestown near the Schraff yeah. factory. So the, so the first day of school, what they decided to do to support the black teachers was to get a van. And we would meet the van at Bunker Hill Community College, and the van would drive us into our schools. And now we were at three different schools, two at the Harvard Kent, two at the Warren Prescott, and me at the Bunker Hill. I watch the news. So I see that, do not go up, um, I think it was Bunker that Hill main Street, drag. the main it's drag. A, it's what it was. People are yeah. out there. So yeah. meanwhile, we're staying at the Bunker Hill Community College, waiting for the van, waiting and waiting and waiting. I'm the youngest of the five of us. Um, way over, um, like, Way over, we see a van sitting there. So they say to me, we think that's the van. How about you run over there, Pat, <laughs> and ask? I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm young, you know. <laughs> Looking back at it, boy, I could run then. <laughs> uh, so I go over, over there, and it is the van. He comes over, and the guy must be, we thought he was about 99 years old, mm -hmm. one foot on a banana peel, okay. <laughs> so we say to him, okay, let me tell you where the schools are. Oh, no, no, I know where the schools are. The first school he takes us to was the Harvard School, which I think had been closed. It had all the weeds growing around it because they combined the Harvard and the Kent. That school was, that other school was non-existent. So we're directing him. And I say to him, whatever you do, just don't take us down Bunker Hill Street because it's, you know, people out picketing and yeah, whatever. It was ugly. It I, was, yeah, yes. It was really ugly. Meanwhile, while we're standing at the, at the, at the college, we could hear the helicopters above. That's right. The motorcyclists, motorcycle police had, yeah, the had assembled, yeah, you know. Yeah. So uh, he drops off the two at the Harvard Kent. Oh, I think I know where this is going. Yeah. You got it. It's going right down Bunker Hill. Right down yeah. Bunker Hill Street. Drops off the two at Warren Prescott. Now I'm the only one in the van going the rest of the way down the Har down the oh, no. street. So I'm like sitting there thinking, oh, I hope I get through this. Yeah. And he's beep 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 trying to part the car crowds to get us by. We get to school, and I say to him, look, our school, my school, gets out early. We get out at two twenty. Harvard Kent doesn't get out till three o'clock. Pick me up first. Okay, okay. 
2.20 comes, and the kids all leave. And you're there by yourself outside on the sidewalk is what I'm guessing. 2.30 comes. Oh, no. The teachers leave. Oh, no. 2.45 comes. The principal leaves. Have a nice day. <laughs> 3 o'clock, custodian says to me, I'm leaving. So I'm sitting out on, on the front steps of the Bunker Hill School with the school clothes waiting for the van to come. So he picks me up last. I got in the van, and I said to the other teachers, you're on your own. I'm driving my car. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm not safe in this van. So oh. that was the only time I went with the van. On Bunker Hill Street, it was, I would say, when you asked me if I was scared about anything, mm -hmm. I would say that time I was terrified. You know, I, I was, I was, at, I don't know if it was the same day, but I was briefly covering Charlestown oh. that year, 75, mm -hmm. and th there were thousands of people oh. lining the streets, and uh, it was so uh, angry and so ugly and so aggressive, mm -hmm. and sure enough, somebody did pick up a brick and throw it through a, a you know the window of a school bus with little kids inside. So I can't imagine what it was like to drive down that. Well, you know, I'm sitting there and you know looking out at these angry faces, yeah. and I thought something that I've never thought before, and I haven't thought since. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to say. I looked at this guy who's beeping the horn, part, trying to part the crowds to get through, and I thought, if somebody comes on this van, I am pushing the driver over and I'm gunning the yeah, gas because yeah. I got to get out of here. Yeah, yeah. I and that's why when they came and picked me up, I said, I'm not doing this again. Mm -hmm. I thought, really, this is crazy. I was safer coming in on my own because I was at the end of Charleston. I didn't have to go through the entire town to get to my school. I was yeah. just doing that because I was on the van. So um, that was it. And, and I don't think the other four of them didn't take the van either. Mm -hmm. They That was it. So we saved the city money. Now, I'm not going to tell you that it got easier going in with my car <laughs> either. <laughs> um, I, I don't remember if it was the second year, I think. It was more... Um, no, it probably was around, this, around that time because I remember the car. Um, so in the, this, the, um, school was on a hill. So I would come in, in the early in the morning and I parked. And then at the end of the day, I would, um, you know, pull out, I would leave with the teachers. So it was after all the kids had gone. And as I said, we used to dismiss the black kids first. They'd get on the bus and, you know, and I remember standing at the window watching them and just feeling my heart breaking, thinking, these kids are going through so, so much. Now, remember, a lot of the white kids weren't coming. So one year, I had a first grade class of seven kids. That was it. Really? So anytime anybody was absent, that ended any reading group, you know. <laughs> you don't have a group when you have so few kids. You but, had some white uh, kids? Or? Well, I had some white kids, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, so one, and I still remember this kid's name. I won't say the whole name. But um, Bobby was in my class. So we would dismiss the black kids. The white kids would be sitting there, and we'd wait for the buses to leave. So Bobby, who was a white kid from Charlestown, says to me, um, you know, we hate black people. So I said, oh, okay. I said, so do you know any black people? He goes, no. I said, so why do you hate black people? He says, because they murder. I said, so why do you think that? He says, I see it on TV. Really? So that's when I asked him, do you know any black people? And he's sitting opposite me, okay? Yeah. He says, no. Now, the little girl in the class who was black, he, they were best friends. But, you know, he didn't realize that. He didn't see her as black or you as he black? No. It was not a concept. They had no idea yeah. what that even meant. Yeah. Um, now, it turned out every day when I would leave school, I would get pummeled either by stones or rocks or... Um, snowballs, and at one point I mentioned it to the, in the teacher's room. Now, remember, I was the only black teacher there. I mentioned it in the teacher's room. Oh, no, no, um, our kids wouldn't do that. That's, that's not happening. So I'm like, this is a figment of my imagination. Yeah. I'm getting hit, hit yeah, by imaginary yeah. stones. Yeah. So um, one of the kids who was throwing the stones was the brother of this kid that I had in my class, and his mother was my lunch attendant. Really? And he was in middle school, so he would, he would be out there throwing stones. Anyway, one day, um, I, uh, one of the other teachers in the building who was, I always joke about her, um, she was Alice. Alice was 70 years old, which at the time felt very old. It did, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Now, now it's like, yeah. she was I, young. Yeah. <laughs> Probably never reached that age, <laughs> right. is what I'm saying. <laughs> at the time, you had to retire at 70, and oh, they just, cha right. they just yeah. changed it. 
So Alice lived a block away. So now we're on a hill. It's all icy. It snowed outside. So I offered Alice a ride home. So she gets in the car. I pull out, get pummeled by the snowballs. It breaks off the body side molding on my car. Oh. So I pull out, I stop the car. Now she's in the passenger seat. I stop the car. I get out to take my body side molding. Alice jumps out of the car. Now picture this little short woman, elderly woman. I'm like, Alice, Alice, don't worry. It's over. They're, they're gone now. She starts running across <laughs> the playground. And I'm like, come back, come back. <laughs> she gets in the car and she says, uh, this has got to stop. She says, I know those kids. She says, I taught those kids. I taught their parents, and I grew up with their grandparents. Uh-huh. This is going to stop. I'm making phone calls. Did she? She made phone calls. Never happened again. Really? I always tell that story because I think that's the power of one. Uh-huh. We all think we can't do anything. We think that we, one person can't make a difference. Alice Slater cha- changed my life. She saved my life. Who knows what would have happened with them hitting me with that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I use the African uh, proverb that says, if you think think you're too small to make a difference, spend the night with a mosquito. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Can I ask you a question right there? Mm -hmm. That power of one, is that why you felt like you had a responsibility to call the students to step up and and push the students? I think that I... Teaching, I had a responsibility to all my students. Um, Yes, I did have a responsibility to make sure that the black students who were coming every day under such uh, turmoil uh, Mm -hmm. and pressure and that they, I needed to make sure that they got every single thing that they could get from me. Um, Now, remember in Charlestown, when I had seven students, I had Asians, blacks, and very few white kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt an obligation to the white kids to let them see, you know, hey, uh, you know, you can learn amongst us. Uh, This is a good environment. So I've always felt, I've always felt an obligation in maybe in different ways to different groups of kids. But yeah, I think that when such a sacrifice is made that we owe it to them to make sure that the sacrifice works for them. Now, um, I can say this because you won't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, sometimes people end up the right person in the right job, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And being a teacher, you were the real deal. I, I think people uh, yeah, listening yeah, to you can yeah. tell that, that you had a kind of commitment and zeal and passion for the, for the work you were doing that, that carried you through. And you went on to, you know, be a principal at a couple different schools and you were a a fancy pants at Harvard. I can't remember if that was the exact title, fancy pants. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but, and you're very clear and forceful about your memories and your opinions, but you don't seem to be bitter. Now, maybe I'm wrong yeah. about that. Um, I would say, now, I've been in education 46 years, yeah. and three years, I would say, I was under assault. And that was not the time when I was in Charlestown. I didn't count that. Really? Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. I think partially, partially, you're right. I, there was no other career I ever wanted. Mm-hmm. No other career. I mean, I, I played teacher. Uh, you know, um, I also played bus rider when I was a little <laughs> <Bus> kid. Bus rider. <laughs> Who plays that game? <laughs> One day I'll explain to you what that entails. Okay. <laughs> um, That's but, for another interview. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I always, always, always wanted to be a teacher. Yeah. I mean, there was no other profession. I loved it, um, and I loved teaching, and I was fortunate enough that when I started to feel like I'm not loving this every single day, yeah. that I was able to move into central office, and I did yeah. curriculum specialist. I did that for a year, and then I became principal. And again, I feel really, really fortunate in that after 20 years of being a principal, and I thought, oh, I'm getting ready, you know, I could move into being assistant superintendent. Yeah. So each time that I was feeling, and I never went down to being bad. I just wasn't at you know two hundred percent that I normally work at. Um, I was ha- there was something open for me to do. Um, but but get back to the you know the the question about bitterness or anger toward even if it was a couple of years out of a long career, it was mm-hmm. still a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, I think that was. 
with my years in Charlestown, uh, the one thing I do regret is that my boss at Northeastern, when I was leaving, said to me, you're going into some historical times, keep a journal. And I didn't. I was busy teaching. Yeah. Um, I think going in every day and seeing those kids, I still remember the name of the first girl I taught to read. Really? Maureen. She got up there, and we were trying to blend words, and finally she got that three-letter word, and she sang it. And both of us were like, yay! You know, it was like, I think it was like cat. You know, it wasn't like, you know, really big. Well, the, the moment. The, the moment yeah. was just, yeah. I mean, and I was like, you know, it was like a big moment for me. Um, I don't know how big it was for her, but it sure was for me. I, I think <laughs> you know? it's the most exciting uh, gift yeah. in the world. Reading. And I think that, I think in some ways, being ignored and not being supervised allowed me to do certain things that I might not have done. I took the kids to Bunker Hill Community College. Now, these are six-year-olds who, um, you know, nobody ever talked about college. I mean, we were, they would be happy to get out of high school. And um, I was excited to take them to college and tell them how they would all be going to college in years, you know. And when we got back, what did they remember? The cafeteria. <laughs> and I'm like, if you go to college for the cafeteria, that works for me. <laughs> go and for any reason. But that's true of the black kids and white kids mm -hmm. and working mm -hmm. class kids, yes. you know. Mm -hmm. And, of uh. course, the irony in Boston is these kids had more in common than they did, right, separately. In some ways, if the parents had gotten, if the adults had gotten out of the way, they would have been fine. They would have been fine. This group yeah. that I took to Bunk Hill Community College was my old white class. No kidding. And yeah. they were all from the projects. One of the kids invited me to her birthday party. <laughs> and I was like, ooh. <laughs> Is your family ready? For <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, and before I said anything, she said to me, oh, no, you better not come. It's not safe. My mother carries a gun. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I don't think I'll be there. <laughs> Now, they were, this is how poor they were. I gave each kid a Christmas gift, mm -hmm. wrapped it up. It was just a box of crayons and probably the box of four or eight crayons and a coloring book. One of the kids, one of the kids, uh, so many of them opened the gifts right there. One of the kids didn't open her gift. Sure. Um, I, um, this is how poor so many of the kids, all of them were. Uh, I gave each kid for Christmas um, a box of crayons and a coloring book, and I wrapped them up, and everybody had the same gift. And most of them opened the gifts in the classroom. One kid didn't open his gift, and I said, well, aren't you going to open your gift? He said, no, um, it, I think it's going to be the only gift under my tree. Aww. So this is, you know, we're talking about really, really poor. Yeah. Um, I mean, hygiene, I got introduced to lice. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard of lice, you know. Um, a lot of, I had one kid, oh, he smelled every day of urine. I had his mother in and almost passed out when mm -hmm. she came in. And what was it? They had no hot water. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this was, this was the kind of poverty that I didn't know. You know, um, people think, oh, black people are poor. I grew up middle class, so we had the hot water. We went to school, you know, in fresh clothes. I mean, this kid would wet the bed and came to school in those clothes the next day. So, you know, I was, this is... These, so I felt obligated to make sure that these kids got every single thing that they could get. And remember, these are all white kids who were all placed in this class because they were low level. I didn't place them there. They had been placed that way the year before. There were so many things that were done that disenfranchised kids. Um, while you're not providing me with materials, they're losing. While you're putting them all together with not you know, having any models that are better... Uh, readers, they're losing, you know. Now, fortunately, I didn't know that. I just thought they were all geniuses. <laughs> so I taught them like they were all geniuses. I'm going to tell you, they were lucky to have you. <laughs> I, I, and I, I was glad that they, looking back on it, I was fine that that was my group. I'd love to know where they are now. Yeah. 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 49 your years legacy? ago. I don't even know what that means, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Um... I hope that it is individual kids that it maybe I impacted. That's what I hope. Not only individual kids, but I am individual teachers that I impacted too. Um, and sometimes you don't even know the impact. Um, I mean, I have, I have some people that I mentored who are now principals. I have a couple people. and. I can think of two of them are quite successful principals, and probably the other ones I can't remember. Um, I, I, you know, part of the problem with teaching such a low grade um, 
is that people don't necessarily remember their first grade teacher. Uh, I was in the bank today, and the, the uh, woman said she had gone to Boston Public School, so I asked her, I said, oh, I said, do you remember your principal from uh, elementary school? She said, no. I'm like, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you to remember me. A lot of us um, remember. But you know, here, I'm going to give you an example okay. of, of somebody you affected. So when my younger son was uh, about, I don't know, how old were he? He and Joe were around eight. And your son and my son. And they they were going to a summer sports camp at Bates College, remember? Oh, right. And you called up the college, <laughs> and you insisted they have a scholarship. Four for scholarships. A, four scholarships, that's right, four scholarships. <laughs> that was the funniest For city thing, kids yeah. to go. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. one of them was this boy. Remember Juan, Juan Carlo? Yeah. 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 Okay, so crank ahead 20 years, right, and... They're having a reunion. This group of kids got very close. And in my living room is my son and, and Juan Carlo, right? Wow. And he said, does Miss Kelly still live here? And I said, well, she lives here. And he said, she changed my life. Really? Yeah. Wow. She changed my oh. life. I know. See, that's that's a legacy. Yeah. This is why you do this. Work. Oh, yeah, that's right. That was the funniest thing. So I did say to the camp, "No, you can't give me one scholarship for one black kid. One black kid's come, not coming up there to be by himself. I want four. <laughs> you and were then, tough on them. And then remember, <laughs> they did it. Juan Carlos' mother was the one who followed us in the car, and, and we're looking behind us, and we're like, "Who is that crazy driver? She just cut off everybody. She had cut through the traffic to make sure she was right behind us because she, she didn't want to get to me. Yeah, she was getting right. to Maine. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. That's that's nice." Nice to know that, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, 46 years of career. 46 was, years, a lot of lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, and I have to say, I feel exceedingly fortunate because even the three years that I call them my Ku Klux Klan years, because, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was seven teachers and seven parents out to get rid of me, mm -hmm. but that was not in Boston public schools. Um, I learned a lot about myself through that time, but I also learned. I learned a lot, and I had a, I've had a really good career. I really love this career. You yeah. really have. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's right. I, uh, I'm sorry that now I feel I'm, I'm glad to be retired, and I'm sorry that now I see so many principals and so many teachers who it's just hard. It's just really, really hard. The work is hard. The work is, yeah. uh, the work is too hard, and it shouldn't be that hard. There mm -hmm. should be more joy in it. This is a lot of joy in teaching. I mean, especially when you teach those younger kids, man. They, they, if you don't laugh every day, then you have not shown up at work. Yeah. I mean, they are, they tell you how it is. You come in with a bad hair day. Oh, I heard about it. <laughs> What'd you do to your hair? <laughs> like, oh, geez. One time I'm teaching and I had, I had braces yeah. and my lips started to blow up. <laughs> One of the kids, what's wrong with your lips? <laughs> I'm like, oh, geez. There's no place to hide. There's not, no, no, they tell you right away. They tell you right away. But they also love you. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they yeah, love they you. Do. Mm. Can you speak to that and then sure. why these things did ultimately work or not? Well, it's a tough one. Yeah. part of it, of course, now, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, I think I'm going to say, looking back, that it has not worked. And I'm going to say it has not worked for a number of reasons. First of all, Boston School Committee... Boston was so entrenched. Um, the school committee was so entrenched. Taking 20 years, 20 years from Brown versus Board of yeah, Education right. to finally desegregating. What a waste of 20 years. All they're doing is litigating rather than making a plan. Well, and, and they did everything they possibly could to resist Absolutely. integration. Absolutely. I mean, it, to, even if they hadn't integrated for those 20 years, if they'd taken that time to get people ready, to talk about it, to change the housing patterns... Or to take a look at what else can we do? Um, and, of course, now we can look back and say, did we need to integrate? We are integrating poor kids with other poor kids. Well, that's it. And, and I always thought the idea that black kids sitting next to white kids would automatically improve was a kind of a, a, a poor argument. It wasn't that the kid was white. It's that the money followed the white kids, mm -hmm. right? And so... To get equal resources in school, equal opportunity, that so, was, you had to 
go someplace where there was some money. So a better solution might have been to have the money come there. There you, you go. Know, the money, the yeah. better teachers, the better materials. I mean, why, why do we want to integrate in South Boston where 2% of the kids went to college? I know. That, and, and it's not even like everybody has to go to college, which you should have the option. And yeah. I'm, I would be willing to bet that more than 2% of the kids wanted to go to college or would have taken that option. So at this point, it, I've thought about this in some ways. Um, maybe if we had done magnet schools. I believe that if you had built a magnet school, even now, if you build a state-of-the-art school that offers every single thing in the middle of Mattapan, that the white kids would get there. Absolutely. In fact, um, that happens. Okay. That, Latin. Latin oh, is an Latin example. school, but, yeah. mm -hmm. but uh, my kids went to a magnet school. They went to the Haley. Okay. And it was, we were there at a really good time. Very activist principal, Bob Berry, you remember okay, him? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And a very active parents group, um, black parents, white parents, it was really strong. And people were knocking on the door to get in. Charter was another one. Exactly. So why didn't we take the models of the Charter and the Haley and, and, more. and move, move them out rather than throw the whole city into turmoil? So I think that, you know, uh, it's all about who's the teacher who's in front of the the kids I, in the I class, and that's you. who you need to put your money there. You could be mm -hmm. sitting on a log. <laughs> yes. yes. And if you have a great teacher sitting mm -hmm. on the other end of the log, mm -hmm. you're going to do mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah, I agree yeah. with you. So. Can you keep 10 Bostonians and set that race and skill and issue for oh. three? What's the matter with the other two? What happened with them? <laughs> what, they're not in Boston? Where did you put them? <laughs> Good question. Uh, what do you think about that? And then are you guys hopeful for the future? Where well, well, I would be one of those. I would be 10 of 10. I, race, is, race is an issue not just in Boston. It's race is an issue in this country. Mm -hmm. Our, this country is built around race and racism. And until we have a conversation about that, why don't we take a look at other places that have had the conversation? Um, Germany. They've had their conversation around, you know, uh, anti-Semitism, Nazism. Nazism. Yeah. Uh, Rwanda. Uh, they're another place. South Africa. Now, I'm not saying that all those places are like, like, you dying to live there, but at least they've had the conversation. We just avoid the conversation, and now what we're doing is going the opposite way. You can't have the conversation uh, without getting fired or you know defunded or whatever. So absolutely, and one of the things I will say um, that I do feel that this city is beginning to have the conversation, and I think that there are some people leading it. Um, you know, I had, well, I told you about my interaction with our previous mayor around race, uh, but he stepped up and started talking about it, yeah, realizing yeah. that it's an issue, but we have to have the conversation. Well, but I think that's an important point though, because if someone had told me 40 years ago that we would have a mayor who's Asian, Asian. and a attorney general, attorney general <laughs> who's black and most of the members of the Boston City Council are black, right? And a, govern and a governor who's a lesbian. That's right. <laughs> and a police commissioner who's black. And a district attorney who's black. And a sheriff. I wouldn't have... Right. We never would have I couldn't that. have imagined that. that. And yeah. that's, that's a mm -hmm. big, important change. Mm -hmm. Although I agree with, with your broader point, which is this is... It's like a cancer. It's, mm -hmm. it's absolutely. endemic. Absolutely. Yeah. And we need to have, it can't be one of those, uh, oh, let's have a town hall meeting. Oh, great. We all talked about race. Okay, we all go home and that's the end of it. It needs to be ongoing. It needs to be deep. It needs to be led. It, there needs to be points that we get to, and it needs to be where people really go down to how they feel and then... Um, and keep coming together. It cannot, it's not a one and done. It's a long-term thing that we have to do. So. I'm with you. Well, we're at the end here. Is there, are there any last thoughts you guys want to share about your relationship? Anything? Anything you guys would like to say to each other? Uh -huh. I'm glad we've been friends for so long. You know, I'm glad. even though even though it's funny because now since I moved, we haven't we don't walk anymore. No. Our walking was hysterical. I think we were really Every good at morning, that. Every morning, five fifteen. Yeah, you could set your watch by us walking yeah. around the pond. Yeah, I went half around Jamaica Pond with my dog. Oh, I remember first it wasn't with the dog though. First we went it was with your coffee cup that you used to hide <laughs> in the in the hedges, <laughs> and then and uh, we solved every problem. I remember yes. the time I needed to do a hard conversation with my secretary. And we had a pen, but no paper, so I wrote it on my hand. <laughs> and I took a shower out. with my hand out. <laughs> and I got to work, and I wanted to say, okay, you need to. <laughs> 
called Judy. <laughs> yeah, right, called Judy. She might remember <laughs> she knows what, what I said. Say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. we did, we it's solved good a lot of the friends. Yeah. yeah, and it's good that we, you know, a lot of the angst, it's, it's funny because it wasn't like we were always solving racial issues. Um, we were solving kids' issues, yeah. which don't yeah. they transcend race? Yeah. Motherhood is like motherhood. It's whether you're black, white, poor, wealthy, you know, whatever. We did discuss our kids. Oh, God. They drove <laughs> us crazy. They were all doing well, too. Oh, my God. Her kid is tenure from 20 high schools, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> most important thing is from college. <laughs> and my kid's a teacher. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm.